Hello, welcome to the Dope Science Show with Stephanie Lowe, a.k.a. Science Stuff with Steph. Thank you for your ears and minds. I hope that the show sparks new ideas, new opportunities, and conversations. I want us to learn and grow. We are all curious, innovative, and experimental in our daily lives. We are all dope scientists. Hey, you guys. I have a really interesting person on the show today. And we're going to try something new where we want to talk about what's new and interesting in science news lately and just have fun with it and see what we learn. So today I have on the show stand-up comic and writer uh, Michi Hall. Hey, Michi. Hey, everybody. What up? I've always watched, like, the science shows in the nature planet. So it's good to talk about it. Oh, awesome. I didn't even know that. That's cool. That's cool. Let me tell you guys um, a little bit about Michi. I've worked with him on another podcast called You Have Me at Black, and he tells his personal story uh, about the time his grandmother saved him from becoming a gangbanger. It's called The Sanctified Gangster. And it was really funny, and it was really great working with Michi, and and a lot of things going on as well. So, Michi, you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself before we go into our topic of the day? Uh, Well, uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. Uh, I teach a class uh, at the school I'm creating in Chicago called Funny School. It's a comedy class about stand-up, different genres of stand-up comedy. And uh, I actually got a comedy out called uh, Effing Gentlemen. I don't know if you can curse on the show. But the F stands for exactly what you think it stands for. <laughs> that's on you can curse all, if you want. <laughs> oh, fucking gentlemen. It's on all major media uh, streaming apps. You know, it's a good album. It's about uh, my tales, dating, and meeting people. Uh, but more than anything, the most important thing y'all need to do is follow me at Joe Custer. That's one word, J-O-K-E-H-U-S-T-L-E-R. And uh, that's my comedy company. We do everything from writing scripts to uh, roasting people in backyard parties. <laughs> So, uh, awesome. that's, that's, Definitely. And I didn't know you were a science nerd either, so that was a bonus. Uh, if, uh, just to catch everybody up out there, I was in the beta club when I was in grammar school, which is a all honor society. And uh, I actually have honor classes off the right. And me and I dropped out. <laughs> Weird. Um, so you dropped out, you said? Uh, well, I didn't drop out. I didn't graduate. Uh, that's the best way to put it. They want to offer me to go to summer school. I had a scholarship, actually, for science and uh, uh, for a college in Pine Bluff. Uh, and the military also wanted me to be an FBI. But I'm a very, very smart person. Um, what they say to contrary beliefs. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I don't, you know what, I feel like often people confuse the the idea of smart versus like intelligence a lot of uh-huh. you know like when you're intelligent that's just like your innate ability to think and come up with ideas and be have critical thinking and then smart is like book learning it's like how many facts you have you know so you got to be intelligent Absolutely. to be a comic yeah at, at that time i had to work and i was living on my own so School, it just didn't make sense. I don't know. Uh, you know, I was doing a couple of things, making my own money. And I just felt that uh, I was, when you sit somewhere and you really blowing through classes, it kind of just, it just felt like a, a bad direction. I still mm-hmm. feel that same way. And I think, uh, like, uh, businesses like Google and things like that, where they're hiring people without uh, college degrees, they're starting to understand that you can't educate yourself outside of what school teaching and maybe do a better job. Uh, my brother homeschooled his, his daughters. So uh, we just do things differently, and the stigmatism that comes with being a dropout is, uh, I guess that's exactly what I'm trying to fight against, not even at this age. The last episode I had on a guest, and he dropped out of high school, and then he got his GED, and then he got his PhD, and he was a felon. And so he, his whole thing is, like, he doesn't code switch. He's got gold teeth and dreads, and he's a scientist. And he just does the way he wants to do it at the, you know, on his own terms. And like he said, whether you go to school or not, like, being curious and, and learning all the time is where you're really going to get true value, I think, as far as out of life and education. It's, it's not right. just having to get, like, a certificate, you know? Right. 
So, did you do your homework? I sent you, like, three articles to read about uh, octopuses. Is that how you say it? Octopuses? Doesn't that I sound think weird? You're, I, I think you don't say that. I don't know. Octopi, octopuses? I feel like I that's my, right. That, that sounds all right. Octopuses. <laughs> 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 it's one of the worst when you look here. You try to say it from your mama a lot. <laughs> but you don't say it all. Ooh, I would love to eat some octopus. <laughs> cool. Oh, everybody that... eating octopus. They sell it at the store now. I, I want me a big old bowl of octopus. You're going to eat them? Well, I've had um, squid. I've had squid, but not octopus. Oh, I've got Calamari is. Is, is calamari like squid or octopus? I believe it's uh, octopus. Oh, then but I have I, had it. I definitely ate some octopus before. <laughs> 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 okay, that was it. That's it. I'm good. <laughs> so, so today we're talking about octopuses, <laughs> and there, there are just a couple of things that inspired me to talk about them. So. Oh, one thing that I, I thought about, like when I was reading it, I often think about like, what if I came back? I'm always thinking about being a born again like animal. So in my head, I, I have this like thing. I'm always like, what if I came back as like an octopus? Like, if you had a choice, what would you think life would be like if you came back as an octopus? What do you think? Oh, uh, absolutely. After what I learned today, I would not want to come back as an octopus, not a male octopus, a female octopus, I guess, but I would definitely not want to be no male octopus. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, because why? Uh, if, uh, why wouldn't you want to be uh, a male octopus? Uh, what did you learn? <laughs> uh, don't make me think about it. Don't make me say it no more because it's, it's just such an uncomfortable subject. It just makes me angry to think about how these whole male octopuses yeah, they sexualize. It's just terrifying. You won't have to say it because I can't say it. I can't talk about the atrocity that comes on okay. when they're trying to get their mate on. <laughs> right? So I was really surprised, too, because I've heard that octopuses are antisocial, right? And mm-hmm. I kind of didn't know why. It's just something I'd heard. And this show, you guys, I always tell people it's PG-13, so do what you want. But um, I've seen those, like, Japanese porn where they have, like, octopus that have sex with people. I know. It's, I, I know. I, I, that, that I'm a weirdo. I've, it's freaky. I've seen it. I, I'm I've sorry. I've never seen <laughs> Japanese porn. What? Like, what are you talking here for that? Like, what is, what is, what is, what is the first box? It's, it's like uh, the cartoons. It's hentai. I'm not saying that I'm like a fan. I'm saying I have seen it, and it uh, came to mind. Okay, you're backpedaling right now. I was trying to find the search <laughs> box because I don't want to see it. I just want to research what you're talking about. So I can be more informed about octopus. Please. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can do your research, and then this will all tie together. So I was thinking when I read these articles, I was like. My initial thought was, like, if I was born again octopus, like, what would that be like? And how does that octopus porn work out? I didn't understand it. But now that I've read a little bit more, it makes more sense. So to give you guys a little bit of background, I wanted to look up why octopuses are, like, so antisocial. And there was quite a few reasons. Um, The main one being male octopuses often are eaten or, or um, they're eaten by the females. Um, oh, man, she just said it. She, they were eaten by the female during the process of sex. <laughs> like, or, or she might not eat you, or she will eat you, or she might just take your, take your little oxytendor off, uh, your, your, your tentacle thing. It's, it's terrifying. Go, it is sorry, terrifying. It is. It is. I was like, no wonder they're so antisocial. So there's all these different ways they have sex. And the, the thing that's interesting is, it's dangerous. There's a lot of suspense. They don't. The males don't know if they'll live through the encounter. But somehow they evolve to have sex in the most intimate way. They use their tentacles, right? Uh, octopuses have eight tentacles, and one of them serves as a sex organ as well as being a regular arm. And what it does, um, it does what 
a penis does, right? So it like it injects sperm into the uh, female octopus. But what's interesting is the female has this sac slash head area called the mantle, and within the mantle are her ovaries, and there's two orifices. So she has two spaces for a tentacle to come inside and inject sperm. Okay? And <laughs> I just, I, uh, you don't have an option to put it in the wrong hole in this scenario. <laughs> I, I guarantee you that'll get you eaten if you put your uh, your octopus in her wrong hole. That I'm sure that I'm sure I'm, I'm sure a bunch of male octopuses die not figuring out what the right hole is. That is a, that is crazy. Cause how do you know which hole is the right hole? Well, they That's don't have that many options, right? So they have the beak, which is the mouth, and then they have these um, the mantle, which has these two holes, and that they do everything out of. So they like uh, they go to the bathroom, they like have sand, water, water every yeah. everything. So you're not gonna miss the hole. So the options are good, but it's dangerous. Well, I'm saying so, there's two holes, right? There's two holes, and they both look the same, right? They do both look the same. Mm -hmm. So if you put your wrong tentacle in the wrong hole, and she already like, should I eat them? Should I not eat them? You know, do I like them? You know what I mean? Like, she tried to figure it out, and you touch that wrong hole with the tentacle, I'm sure you're going to get eaten. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying is it's already <laughs> stressful. You fumbled around in the darkest of the, of, the, of the ocean. You can't figure it out. You're nervous because you might get eaten. And not just in that process, you might hit the wrong hole. And that might be a whole reason why a lot of octopus get eaten. That's it. That's just, that's my theory. I just started out. I, I'm sorry. I, no, it's it's fine. I mean, I, my mind kind of runs when I'm reading these as well. I'm like, I'm like, how does this work? How does this work? So what the, they do is the males have all these different tricks, right? Because they've got to figure out how are they going to reproduce and survive. So some um, have really long tentacles. And they and they think that the octopuses with the longest arms evolved this way because their mates, the female octopuses of that particular species, is more aggressive and cannibalistic than, say, other species. So the ones with the really long tentacles uh, mate in a way that's called the reach over, right? So they will. <laughs> no, no, not, not a reach around, a reach over. Because I know but, what a reach around is. <laughs> well, either or. They call it the reach over, but it's the reach around, it's whatever, and they'll take their tentacle and kind of like sneak in and then like ha uh, inject the sperm into her orifice. Um, well, you know, and sometimes if they're if they're big enough, they don't even have to go inside the cave. They just let their tentacle find its way. So you mean even in the octopus world, it's all about how long your tentacle is? I can't believe this. This is just uh, too much. Stuff. Yes. So, yes. so if your tentacle ain't long enough, that's another reason you can eat. Oh man, that is crazy. Poor octopus, you can't even get it on. And your tentacle is just out for anybody to see. So if you walk up to the other octopus, she's sitting there, and you're like, you know, here's my tentacle, and she'd be like, I'm gonna eat. You. You're right. <laughs> But if it's a really uh, long, if your tentacle is really long, you have a greater chance of survival because your whole body isn't in close proximity, so she can't strangle you, which is how they normally uh, kill the male. They they like strangle him during sex. So yes, because uh, <laughs> they got I mean, you know that's not like a good way to go out, as they say. They say they say, but you know, you get a pregnant, supposedly she could have. Up to uh, was it a couple hundred babies? If if yes. you do it right, right, and that's what makes it worth it for them. Even though they die often, the chances of survival and having your offspring survive are great enough for males and female octopuses to keep trying this. And they have different ways. So we talked about the ones with the long arms, right? And then mm -hmm. there's the ones that. They, it's called mounting. They jump on top of her mantle or what you guys think of as the bulging part where the brain is or whatnot, and they'll just inject the sperm real quick while they're, like, on top of her mantle. Like, that's with one the around, with, with the reach and, around move with the, uh, with, the, with the penis tentacle. No, this yeah. one is where they they take their whole body. They tend to be the smaller species to do this. They'll take their whole body and just jump on top of her mantle and uh, like do their thing and the males are smaller than the females usually and um they'll do it that way 
and that's the most dangerous way. <laughs> and then there's the other ones where they will um, disguise themselves um, to look like a female or kind of look like they're in the background, like camouflage, and then they'll quickly, like, insert their sperm in that way. Like they'll, so, I mean, uh, should they do some kind of Me Too thing for the women? I mean, like, I know they do <laughs> men, but maybe maybe if these guys weren't so disrespectful, these octopus weren't so disrespectful when they came at them, and was sneaking on them and, and, and putting on disguises and all that kind of stuff. It, they might have a little more a little more success rate. It seems like it seems pretty aggressive to me. You it know? does. It does seem really aggressive. You know, and, and we don't know why because there's so many different types of octopuses and they do it different ways. But the fact that there's danger um, that comes with sex means that the men have evolved to be sneaky about it because they want to live. You know, Mm -hmm. so we talked about the long arm, reach over the mounting. And then there's another, there's two. There's one where I thought was really interesting, where instead of trying to even risk life or death, what they do is they will just break off the penis arm and just put it inside of her and, like, swim away as fast as possible. Uh, that's not like my move. That's the one I, if it was a test, that's the one I circle. I was like, hey, just take this right here and be out. And just let her have it. <laughs> just let her have it. <laughs> yeah, just let her have it. I mean, you know, that's, and ultimately, I think that's what the female species want from all men at the end of the day. So, I mean. He sees that it uh, receives the penis, because um, they're not, they don't all mate the same way, like different species of the octopus mate differently. But the ones uh, that mate where they receive the penis from the male, they can use it at their convenience. So that means they can use the sperm right away or it could last even months before they choose to use it to uh, fertilize their eggs. I'm like, wow. Just, just sitting in there chilling until she's ready to get her thing. That, 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 uh-huh. Is that crazy? If you're going to take my penis tentacle, don't, don't just have it sitting around up just laying around. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of rude. You know what I mean? Like, like what do you need to what? Like, I would hate to meet an octopus because she got a, little, a whole tentacle just hanging out of it. And she's like, well, don't worry about that. That relationship is over with. Uh, oh, it's like up. that, too. Like, they don't fall out of her her um, ovaries. Like, it'll just stay there forever. Mm-hmm. Like, how, multiple how you penises. Know that? How you supposed to know that's the bottom of the ocean? You walk up to her, she already satisfied. Guess what's going to happen now? She's going to eat you. Yeah. Yeah, she's very likely going to eat you. And but there is a, a, a interesting species. Um, it's a really big octopus. I forget what it's called. Um, it is called the Pacific striped octopus, and they're super interesting because they have they sex make- beak to oh, beak. Yeah. Somehow they. And they exchange the sperm through the beak, I think, which is like their mm-hmm. mouth, which I think is interesting. So it's, yeah, is that the one that take like thirty minutes or so to, to actually do the whole process of mating? Yeah. Take time to do the mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of like big, missionary style. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm a big octopus thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like your preferred way. <laughs> Yeah, ain't nothing like the little beak to beak action. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? You get it? Beak to beak. Mm-hmm. Yes, beak to beak. <laughs> yeah. You ain't gonna eat me. I'm gonna eat you first, huh? Huh? That's what I can joke. I get it. Huh? And those ones are romantic. Like they can cohabitate after sex. Like all the other ones, soon sex is over, they like they stay away from each other because of the danger of cannibalism. But these ones that beak to beak. They can live together and they don't eat each other. Yeah, because uh, if I put that beak on you, what you gonna do after that? How you gonna how you gonna how you gonna eat me after I just ate you? Come on, man! I just put the real beak on you right now. You can't do nothing about it. I put that beak on you. Yeah, we must have evolved to that, and yeah, maybe that's which you would be born again if you had to choose. That would be the octopus you would be. Yeah, I'd be the beak to beak octopus down there with a thousand tons of pressure on me. Put my beak up on you. Yeah. Into the ocean. Come on, man. You can feel all the electric energy around us because that's how fish <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean. They go off electric energy. Boy, it'd be going down down there. My beak, I'd be, man. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, it was interesting. Um, uh, an octopus is different than a squid. Like a squid, even though they're uh, similar uh, as far as being their cephalopods, 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 that's what they're called. Cephalopods, um, yeah. Cephalopods, uh, cephalopods. Uh, uh, the clams and the, uh, what, the starfish? What, what are the animals? Starfish? Mollusks and uh, clams and, and starfish. Yeah, they're all part of the same, like, class of animal or invertebrate which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But squids, unlike octopuses, they do a drive-by. They just go near the female squid and, like, spray sperm all over her. And then yeah, be like, like, oh, you want this or not? And she'd be like, eh, maybe. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just, she chooses. She just, just busts on my side for no reason. But I guess what? I, I, exactly. I little, little oh, man. I am <laughs> man. man. Animals are so interesting, and it's so easy to go off on, like, a really perverted tangent with them, which I, I think is kind of fun. My man is so dirty, but you go to jail for all the stuff they're talking about. So, like, if I just walk up to a legend, they say, I think you're very attractive. <laughs> then put my uh, my child my child uh, jeans all on the legs and be like, huh, you gonna, you like it? You don't like it? Let me know. Oh, well, it's cool. I'm going to move around. That's just, right? that's just crazy. Yeah, that's just, that's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then, like, um, there, it's it it makes so. When I read this, I was like, oh, now the octopus hentai makes more sense. Now I'm not recommending you guys go and look into it, but if you have seen this stuff before, it makes more sense now. I never understood. Nope. Are you talking about the octopus anime porn again? Are you just uh-huh. keep on talking about that? You just keep on saying, okay, I will go watch the anime porn. <laughs> the search box to find it. I, I will go look. I will find it. But, you know. I'm just saying, once I was better educated, it made more sense. Because <laughs> I was like, how did this even come a thing? Like, I don't understand. I, no, how did you get that? Like, who, what scenario? Like, how do you walk up on accidental anime? Uh, octopus form. Well, it wasn't accidental. I'm a curious person. So someone told me about it, and I was uh-huh. like, what? I've never heard of this. And then um, I have a friend, a.k.a. Google, and I looked it up. And then I was like, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Interesting. How? And here we are. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is very attractive. If you... If you if we was in the ocean and at the bottom, and I and I heard that conversation about you was down there watching some human anime porn, <laughs> put my beak on you. I'm like, you know what? This is a sex I'm going to give it his beak. Horrible. Put his beak. <laughs> <laughs> we should do our own anime movie, Beak to Beak. We should call it. <laughs> So the reason why we're talking about all this, like, octopus sex and social behavior, antisocial, why are they antisocial, we've learned it's because they can they can die from sex and close contact with other octopuses. They'll eat each other. So this brings me full circle to this research that was released maybe a couple of weeks ago. I'm slow, but by the time you guys hear it, you'll still be good. Um, there was this article called Octopuses given mood drug ecstasy revealed genetic link to evolution of social behaviors in humans. And you might think, what? So basically what they did is they gave octopuses molly or MDMA, okay? And the reason why they did that is because even though our brains are different than an octopus. We have some similar behaviors as far as being smart and having memories and things like that. And then the fact that they are social during sex, even if it's not after sex, they do show some social behavior. So that made the scientists want to figure out what do we have in common? Like if, you know, if they give this drug to the octopus, how will it behave? And how does that connect to you, how humans behave under this drug? Right? Now, what, what were they expecting to, to, like, who makes up these tests? Like, what, like, I, I don't understand what the, uh, like, I get science and experiments, but that clearly was some, old, was some old dude sitting around doing mollies 
And looking at the octopus, like, you know what? I'm going to get up my way to the octopus. <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> I heard, I, I heard the females eat the males, so let's see what happens. Like, I, I get it. And, they, and uh, the article was uh, definitely saying about how the octopus was sucking on the glass tank. Because I, I figured because of the molly, the tank probably was warm and it felt different. So he just would put his whole body on the on the on the tank. But I I don't know what other reaction they would expect to get. They gonna get horny. They gonna want to rub stuff. <laughs> now, well, octopus they... on crack. That's what I want to see. I want to see octopus on crack. <laughs> y'all, all eight of his arms doing something else, like in the like in the cartoon, the working jobs. Yeah. <laughs> that. Well, that I don't. Good. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I think you're right. Like they probably definitely had a theory. Like, okay, this is how humans are. And this is probably how the octopus is going to be. But let me share the the experiment with the audience since they didn't get a chance to hear it, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So you said, like, what was the purpose? So I'm just going to read it, you guys, okay? So this study was published September 20th in a scientific journal called Current Biology. Um, And the reason why they did this is because they wanted to study the impact of psychiatric drug therapies um, in animals that are distantly related to people. And so the brains of octopuses are more similar to those of a snail than a human, but because of our common, some of our common behaviors, they thought it would be worth a try. And they found that certain brain chemicals or neurotransmitters, which send signals between the neurons that are required for social behaviors, are evolutionary conserved. So what that means is, when a gene is evolutionarily uh, conserved, that means that was a gene that has remained essentially unchanged throughout the evolution of that species. And uh, usually this gene is unique and it's like necessary or essential. And if you get rid of this gene, um, it's likely to be fatal to the species. So they think that social closeness may be a evolutionary uh, conserved behavior. So what they did is they took a closer look at the uh, genomic sequence of the California cheese spot octopus. So this is specifically the gene regions that control how neurons hook neurotransmitters to their membrane. So they found octopuses and humans have nearly identical genomic uh, codes for this transmitter that binds the neurotransmitter serotonin to the neuron's membrane. So you're like, what does this mean? So basically they found the region of the brain that we have in common with an octopus, and this region also controls serotonin in our brain. And serotonin is a chemical that regulates our mood, okay? So this chemical is also where the drug MDA or ecstasy or molly um, binds to the brain cells and gives you an altered mood, right? Um, so mm. they decided, all right, let's throw these um, octopuses in a, a tank filled with water and um, molly. So um, they took three connected water chambers. One was empty, one had a plastic action figure under a cage, and one had a female or male octopus under a cage. And then the four male and female octopuses were given the molly, which they absorbed through the water through their gills inside the tank. And then they put them in these experimental chambers for 30 minutes to see what would happen. So all four tended to spend more time in a chamber that already had an octopus in it, and which is weird, right, because normally they're antisocial. But with molly, they got super social, right? Right, rubbing on each other and stuff, Right. So so what they did is, like you said, they, they were hugging the cage. They put the mouth parts on the cage. They were just rubbing themselves all over this cage that had another octopus in it. And they wanted to be touched and social. And under normal circumstances, of course, they're antisocial. So this suggests that the same brain circuits that guide social behavior in octopuses are similar to the same ones that we have in human beings. And they said, you know, this is a a new test, so you can't, like, directly compare it against humans. 
but it's really interesting to see that octopuses can be social under the right circumstances. Give them a bunch of molly, and they're going to be... Yeah. <laughs> Give them a bunch of molly, and they're going to be super social. So it wasn't because the they were warm. It's because they wanted to be with the other octopus. Have you ever no, done they, molly they or know anyone who's ever done it? No, I have not done molly. I, I'm already too, uh, too horny. I felt like if I... Being Molly, I just like to go right into all the way creep, and I I just don't want to I don't want to be out of control. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Like it just seems like a, too much to risk. You uh, take a drug to enhance sexuality, and then you walk in a room full of women. It it, it just sound it just sound like a bad movie. <laughs> so I always. Uh, I think you're me right. Too, I'm terrified. <laughs> Yeah. I think you're right. Like, I do think um, it's risky. It's definitely risky. It's illegal. It's a Class A Schedule One drug, right? So, um, number one, it's illegal, you guys, if you didn't know. And um, we have, with anything, there's consequences. Like, you have the good. I mean, I mean, is it good? Like, everyone's experience on the drug is different. But there's always, like, physical after effects. And that part is risky, and that mar- that part makes me feel like, hmm, this isn't something you want to play around with. But I do know that they want to possibly use it for therapy for people who have, like, PTSD and other social, um, like, anxiety type of disorders. Mm-hmm. So it, it can have some benefits with the right dosage and, like, a doctor and stuff like that. You know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's it's- just, uh, some people... Some people lose they uh they vibe and uh you know it would be I'm sure it's necessary if uh you know to to bring it back for some people. Yeah, it, you never know. I I do think it's worth studying. I do. I don't know about. I mean, you can't really. I don't. I always feel conflicted. All these studies are on animals, and I always feel like the poor animal. Like I don't know. You know, is it ethically right to experiment on animals? What do you think? Uh, no, you shouldn't experiment on animals. What? I mean, but I, I mean, experiment got to be done. I get that. And you know, some I guess you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. In so many words, uh, you know, because I mean, I, I guess I, I would want to know what medicines or foods or things are safe. Uh, and there's no real way to prove that, but to do animal testing. So, I mean, it's just one of those things that you really don't want to talk about or, or think about, but it's almost a, a necessary evil in so many ways. But in situations like where you're trying to figure out mollies or or regular things that I I, I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to say because uh, you never know how they found the cure to cancer or uh, the cure to uh, HIV in so many words. Not the cure, but, you know, the treatments for that. And, yeah. you know, the scientists are in a tough position where they have to, Deal with the science of it, and and dealing with the science of it, you gotta make sacrifices. So it's, I'm gonna keep my, I feel so bad for all of them to be done like that. You know? It is true. But I, I I would definitely be willing to uh, do a Molly and be put in a tank with three other women and see how it goes. And they can definitely study my reaction and have my brain. I'm sure my brain is close to humans as possible. So, <laughs> uh, but I'd definitely willing to be an experiment. I would definitely do it as an experiment if I was monitoring. And everything was yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, what a good well, day that was. It was you're like um, I was gonna say. Well, I I was gonna say you're smarter than me. Um, I've tried Molly. I actually recorded a story about that, and it's gonna be part of this episode, so you guys can hear um, my experience with Molly. Um, I tried it a couple times in my life. Um, a long time ago. <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, I, w- I would do it if I was in a safe, like if I had a relationship and there was one girl and we was in a hotel room. I would do it. Like I wanted to do it, but I just haven't had a safe safe to do it. I think women, well, I can't say that because when it comes to sex, drugs, or thing, anything inducing sexuality, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's just where you take in and who you with, you know, right. uh, for each gender, you know. But it's we'll, funny, we'll though. Yeah, you'll have to listen because I'm going to um, put it at the end of the show. Um, I pretty much relive the experience and share it with you guys. But um, basically, it's funny because people think of Molly, Ecstasy, MDA, MDMA as like a sex drug. 
but it's really not. It's more like an empathy drug. It just makes you feel like one with humanity and one with people. So that was pretty much how I I, I experienced it, and it was with my boyfriend cool. at the time in a safe mm-hmm. setting. Um, and I definitely was feeling like one with the world, but it wasn't for me. Um, it wasn't all fun and games for sure. So you'll have to check it out. Let me know what you think. Well, I'm sure if I do it, Molly, I would want to become one also. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very important to do, if you do experiment with it, to be in a safe setting with people you trust and, um, People always think, oh, my God, let's do it at a rave. I would never. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know how people do that. It, what, I, I don't know how people do it. I could not function. But, um, yeah. Well, that was pretty much it. it. It was good sharing this with you, Michi, and learning with you and um, just having fun with this. Um, do you want to tell the audience again where they can find you at or if you had any questions for me? Um, well, uh, yeah, well, like, like, don't forget my comedy album, uh, Fucking Gentlemen. It's on all streaming apps, and you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or whatever at Joe Kessler, J-O-K-E-H-U-S-T-L-E-R. Uh, you know, pretty much you do them things. You, you, I got uh, more albums coming out, and I tour with a couple different great comedians. So uh, just follow me on my social media, and uh, you better keep up with all my uh, hypodestries. Yeah. It was great. It was really good talking about this. And uh, it's really nice to read new information. I did learn a lot about the octopus. Uh, I think, I don't know if I'm going to ever be let my guards down in my next sexual encounter, just thinking about what they're going through. That that <laughs> that that was that was terrifying. That was actually, I just couldn't imagine that life, like me getting down with somebody, then they just start spinning and snap my little good time off and off into the wilderness. That would be terrible. And or choke me strangling. But I learned that today, so I cannot complain about any kind of sexual encounters I have for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. <laughs> See? We made the world yeah. a better place. Now you're going to be happier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> at least I ain't the octopus. Hey, you might be mean to me now, but at least I'm not the octopus. At least you ain't do that. That makes things light. I know. I know. It's really, yeah, it was really interesting and really a hard life. So I, I don't think I'd want to be a born-again octopus. So that's that's mm-hmm. going off the list. All right, okay. You guys like my singing? All right, okay, all right, okay. It's gonna be a story time today. Cause I'm gonna tell a story. And I'm scared. But I'm doing it for science, guys. So if you have any kids listening, you might want to take them off the podcast. You might want to turn it down or put in your headphones. It's not going to be explicit, but I will be sharing a story about the time, the last time and first time I ever did um, Molly, a.k.a. I think MD, MA. Okay, you guys ready? So quite a few years ago now, I was with my boyfriend at the time and we were like okay we're gonna have this amazing little getaway we're going to go to Venice Beach Ooh, we're gonna get our own little uh, apartment for the weekend awesome right on the beach it's still there it's my favorite place to go and we're gonna try Molly because I had never tried it And I'm a curious person. So this is how I feel about drugs, okay? I feel like drugs can be scary. Drugs can be interesting. Drugs can be all the good, all the bad. It's Drugs are just a part of the human experience. And because I'm a human and I like to experience things, I behave like a human. So I wanted to try Molly. And... I was a little nervous though, because I was like, oh my gosh, it's like your brain, you know? You're like, first of all, this is what goes through my mind. I'm like, I don't know how to get it, so someone else has to get it for me. 
<laughs> I don't know who's to verify this. Really, Molly. Like, it could be anything. So, it's like you're taking a risk. And that's scary in itself. Because you're like, it could be speed. It could be something else. But it should be Molly. Because if they want to repeat customer. But still, you never know. So, I thought that I was going to want to experience this on the boardwalk in Venice. So Venice in um, Venice, California in LA uh, County is right at the beach. It's a historic area. When you think of white boys can't jump, when you think of like 80s and people like on the beach, uh, um, roller skating, threes a company, just like on and on. <clears throat> That's Venice Beach. And the boardwalk is what I think of in my head is like the Jersey Shore or something. You know, the place where people just walk the boardwalk and that's the actual entertainment. And there's shops and there's acts and street vendors. And and there are some street people and they're living their lives. And there's like, this was a great time at Venice. Unfortunately, it's been gentrified since then. Snapchat like took over and like wiped out everything. It was, but anyways, this is when it was still cool, you know. And so they had the freak show on the south side of the beach, and that was an actual freak show. Like you know, people who are in the circus, they're carnival people, and they would do these shows, and it was great. And next door to it was, I think it was called Ink, like LA Ink. It was a tattoo shop, and they both of those uh, places had reality shows that were on television at the time. And then across from them, it was always like the drum circle people who would play the drums at three or four o'clock on every like weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And I remember one time I went into the drums and I got in the middle and I was just dancing, and I ended up feeling like I was in a trance. I was there forever forever and then if you go further down it's like one end of the beach it's the the break dancers and they're gonna do their dancing and then they're gonna do this trick at the end where they have to jump over 20 people there was like a crew on the south side and a crew on the north side then on the north side as well that's where you had the, the basketball courts and that's where all the black people were hanging out like not just black people but a lot of black people hanging out and like playing basketball and, and on Sundays people would go there and there were like epic you know games and it's like street basketball so everybody's talking shit and there's an MC and it's just great and behind them was a skate park so at the skate park you would just watch everyone do tricks and people travel around the world to like skate at this park it was just my favorite place it was just wonderful I still recommend you go there it's super fun it's just it's lost a lot of that like independent energy because of the big corporations who decided to like buy beach front property so they could be a part of the scene but really they just killed the scene so I'm thinking Molly let's do Molly within this like atmosphere because I just want to take it all in and just do this and uh, my boyfriend at the time was like he knows me I get excited I'm a, I mean I get excited like <laughs> you know and so like um he was like, no, babe, why don't, why don't we just like take it in the apartment? And cause he'd done it before <laughs> and he was like, and we'll just relax and see how you feel. And I was like, okay, we could do that. So we do that and I'm going to share how I felt, how I recall feeling through this experience. It might be rambling, but I'm kind of just living it out loud to re-share it with you guys. So, I remember taking it and being like, okay, this is cool. And then I just remember getting really energetic, like, ooh, this is really cool. Uh-huh. Okay, I really like this. And, <laughs> and being like bubbly. And then it was just like... I had I have anxiety and it was probably worse at that time and and then I remember the next feeling being like a thought of someone I loved who I'm, I worry about because he struggles in life and with like alcohol and mental illness and I was like suddenly my mind was fixated on that and I was like oh my gosh what 
I, I know how he must feel. Like suddenly I had this wave of empathy and I was like, I know what it's like. Cause I was like, Oh my God, this drug is like so great. What if you got addicted to something and you couldn't like stop and like you gave up your whole life for it. And I just went on this like anxiety, like rambling. I was like, Oh my God, what if I, I was like, like, Oh my God, poor him. He said he can't help his addiction. And then he's crazy. And I was like, I give you crazy. And I just started freaking out. And my um, boyfriend was like, calm down, it's going to be okay. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I was like, I didn't know, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Like, oh my God. Ah, and I was crying. It was like, I could not control my emotions. It was like, ah, ah. like I was happy, like emotional, like up and downs. Like I, I, w- I was like, I am bipolar in this very moment, manic. And I, it was just like, I could not be outside. I was curled up. I was like, oh, the lights, turn off the lights, all the colors. I was just overwhelmed. And I'm so glad I didn't leave the apartment. And then the night went on. And I remember at one point I was like, oh, my stomach hurts. My stomach hurts so bad. And then I was like, I've got to go to the bathroom. And I went to the bathroom and I had it like, you know, take a dump (laughs) you know and we're doing number two and I just remember being super still on this molly because it lasts for a long time and it was just like a weird feeling to like be doing like taking a you know going to the bathroom while you're on this drug because it was like a very like intense experience it kind of felt good but it was like amazing and I was just all fully like experiencing more like my intestines it was weird it was weird and then I remember being in the bathtub just laying in the water for hours and talking and like him like holding my hand and making me feel good and and I was like wow I love you I was like I I love you and I can finally trust you You got me through this emotional. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And so like, I finally sobered up. And the next day I was like, oh, and I thought to myself, I'm never doing this again. And I was like, feeling in love. Like we did this breakthrough. Wow. Wow. Like I'm different and I'm a different person. Like I woke up, like that was a breakthrough, like emotionally, like. I got in touch with all my fears. I got in touch with every emotion I had in my whole body the night before. And I was like, I love you. Not because he gave me drugs, but it was like I felt this bond. Okay, this intense bond. Like, okay. And um, and we had already been together, but it was our breakthrough. Because I was having trouble like trusting him emotionally. And showing myself, like being so vulnerable. Because I, I tend to be a person who I try to control I could control things um you know about myself and like my emotions and and um so I'm working on that but at and I was working on it at the time but I was still you know that was years ago so anyways it was a big breakthrough and I knew I would never do that again never <laughs> But that was my experience. And I feel so bad for those octopuses. Or is that how you say octopuses? Because I wonder if they're like humans. Do they ever experiment with um, drugs that they have in their natural environment? Or was this something completely... I mean, it had to be completely foreign. You know, and it doesn't have to be. I wonder if there's anything in their environment that would have been comparable. But the way the article read, it seemed as if, you know, they, we, they just gave it to them. And I'm like, those poor octopuses. I, I feel so bad for them. I feel bad for anyone who who doesn't know what they're about to do. And, I, and, 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 and for some people... Is a good time because maybe they've been, you know, my boyfriend was coaching me, but I'm just an anxious person. So maybe other people, they have really great experiences and or whatnot. Um, but that was my experience. So I thought I'd share it with you guys. Uh, you may have tried it yourself. You may have considered it. You, you may have just never heard of it. So 
I shared that for science. So if you guys ever like pulled this and used this against me to keep me from working or running for president, I will never forgive you. <laughs> but I'm brave, so I don't care. So I will talk to you guys soon. Peace. Well, now it's time for the glossary portion of the episode. All right, here we go. So what is MDMA? MDMA is a class A substance that is usually found in a pill form. It's a psychoactive drug, which is structurally similar to methamphetamine and acts as a central nervous system stimulant. It produces a mood enhancement, increased energy, and other empathetic effects. MDMA was first manufactured by Merck as far back as 1912 as a potential appetite suppressant. However, they never marketed it as such. So they created it, but they never sold it as a um, appetite suppressant. Next, are there therapeutic uses for MDMA? Well, brain imaging experiments have revealed how ecstasy produces feelings of euphoria in users. Are there therapeutic uses for MDMA? Brain imaging experiments have revealed how ecstasy or MDMA might be useful in the treatment of anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. FMRI scans have shown reduced blood flow in the visual cortex, which is the back of the brain, and in the limbic system, which is the middle of the brain, under MDMA. The results show that MDMA decreases activity in the limbic system, a set of structures which are involved in emotional responses. Communication between the medial temporal lobe and medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in emotional control, was also reduced. This effect and the drop in activity in the limbic system are opposite to patterns seen in patients who suffer from anxiety. MDMA also increased communication between the amygdala and the hippocampus. Hippocampus, you guys know I can't speak, so look it up. (laughs) Studies on patients with PTSD have found a reduction in communication between these two areas of the brain. Researchers found that MDMA caused reduced blood flow in regions of the brain linked to emotion and memory. These effects may be related to the feelings of euphoria that people experience on the drug. As part of the study, um, some volunteers were asked to recall their favorite and worst memories while inside a uh, MRI scanner. They rated their favorite memories as more vivid, emotionally intense, and positive after MDMA versus when they took a placebo. And they rated their worst memories as less negative. This was reflected in the way that parts of the brain were activated more or less strongly under MDMA. These results were published in the International Journal Neuropsychopharmacology. MDMA, more commonly known as ecstasy, promotes strong feelings of empathy in its users and is classified as a Schedule I drug, a category reserved for compounds with no accepted medical use and a high abuse potential. So why do we want to study it? We've learned a lot about the nervous system from understanding how drugs work in the brain, both therapeutic and illicit drugs. If we start understanding MDMA's molecular targets better and the biotech and pharmaceutical industries pay attention, it may lead to the development of drugs that maintain the potential therapeutic effects for disorders like autism or PTSD but have less abuse liability. MDMA is described as an empathogen, a compound that promotes feelings of empathy and close positive social feelings in users. What does genomics mean? The main difference between genomics and genetics is that genetics scrutinizes the functioning and composition of the single gene, whereas genomics addresses all genes and their interrelationships in order to identify their combined influence on the growth and development of an organism. So basically, genetics scrutinizes the functioning, so how uh, a gene works, of a single gene. 
So the genetic scrutinizes the functioning and makeup of a single gene, whereas genomics addresses all genes and how they relate to each other in order to, to combine、um, and influence growth and development of an organism. What is serotonin? Serotonin is a monoamine neurotransmitter and is popularly thought to be a contributor to feelings of well being and happiness. So there's a glossary, you guys. Yay, we learned something. Well, thank you guys for listening. I hope you learned something. I hope you laughed. And happy, happy New Year's, happy holidays. And I'll see you guys next year. Peace.